Chapter Thirteen of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Almer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I turn from the life of our circle, acknowledging that ours is not life but a simulation of life, that the conditions of superfluity in which we live deprive us of the possibility of understanding life, and that in order to understand life, I must understand not an exceptional life such as ours, who are parasites of life, but the life of simple, laboring folk, those who make it life, and the meaning which they attribute to it. The simplest laboring people around me were the Russian people, and I turned to them into the meaning of life which they gave. That meaning, if one could put it into words, was as follows. Every man has come to the world by the will of God. And God has so made men that man can destroy his soul or save it. The aim of man in life is to save his soul, and to save his soul he must live godly, and to live godly he must renounce all pleasures of life, must labor, humble himself, suffer, and be merciful. That meaning people obtain from the whole teaching of faith transmitted to them by their pastors and by the traditions that live among the people. This meaning was clear to me and near to my heart. But together with this meaning of the popular faith of our non-sectarian folk, among whom I lived, much was inseparably bound up that revolted me and seemed to me inexplicable. Sacraments, church services, fasts, and the adoration of relics and icons. The people cannot separate one from the other, nor could I. And strange as much of what entered into the faith of these people was to me, I accepted everything, and attended the services, knelt morning and evening in prayer, fasted, and prepared to receive the Eucharist. And at first my reason did not resist anything. The very things that had formerly seemed to me impossible did not now evoke in me any opposition. My relations to faith before and after were quite different. Formerly life itself seemed to me full of meaning and faith, presented itself as the arbitrary assertion of propositions to me quite unnecessary, unreasonable, and disconnected from life. I then asked myself what meaning those propositions had and convinced that they had none, I rejected them. Now, on the contrary, I knew firmly that my life otherwise has and can have no meaning, and articles of faith were far from presenting themselves to me as unnecessary. On the contrary, I had been led by indubitable experience to the conviction that only these propositions presented by faith give life a meaning. Formerly, I looked on them as some quite unnecessary gibberish, but now, if I did not understand them, I yet knew that they had a meaning, and I said to myself that I must learn to understand them. I argued as follows, telling myself that the knowledge of faith flows, like all humanity with its reason, from a mysterious source. That source is God, the origin both of the human body and the human reason. As my body has descended to me from God, so also has my reason and my understanding of life, and consequently the various stages of development of that understanding of life cannot be false. All that people sincerely believe in must be true. It may be differently expressed, but it cannot be a lie, and therefore if it presents itself to me as a lie, that only means that I have not understood it. Furthermore, I said to myself, the essence of every faith consists in its giving life a meaning which death does not destroy. Naturally, for a faith to be able to reply to the questions of a king dying in luxury, or an old slave tormented by overwork, or of an unreasonable child, of a wise old man or a half-witted old woman, of a young and happy wife, of a youth tormented by passions, of all people in the most varied conditions of life and education, if there is one reply to the one eternal question of life, why do I live and what will result of my life? The reply, though one in its essence, must be endlessly varied in its presentation, and the more it is one, the more true and profound it is, the more strange and deformed must it naturally appear in its attempted expression, comfortably to the education and position of each person. But this argument, justifying in my eyes the queerness of much on the ritual side of religion, did not suffice to allow me in the one great affair of life, religion, to do things in which seemed to me questionable. With all my soul I wished to be in a position to mingle with the people, fulfilling the ritual side of their religion, but I could not do it. I felt that I should lie to myself and mock all which was sacred to me were I to do so. At this point, however, our new Russian theological writers came to my rescue. According to the explanation these theologians gave, the fundamental dogma of our faith is the infallibility of the church. From the admission of that dogma follows inevitably the truth of all that is professed by the church. The church as an assembly of true believers united by love and therefore possessed of true knowledge became the basis of my faith. I told myself that divine truth cannot be accessible to a separate individual. It is revealed only to the whole assembly of people united by love. To attain truth one must not be separate, and in order to not separate oneself, one must love and must endure things one may not agree with. Truth reveals itself to love, and if you do not submit to the rights of the church, you transgress against love, and by transgressing against love, you deprive yourself of the possibility of recognizing the truth. I did not then see the sophistry contained in this argument. I did not see that union and love may give the greatest love, but certainly cannot give us divine truth expressed in the definite words of the Nicene Creed. I also did not perceive that love cannot make a certain expression of truth an obligatory condition of union. I did not then see these mistakes in the argument, and thanks to it was able to accept and perform all the rites of the Orthodox Church without understanding most of them. 
I then tried with all the strength of my soul to avoid all arguments and contradictions, and tried to explain as reasonably as possible the church statements I encountered. While fulfilling the rights of the church, I humbled my reason and submitted to the traditions possessed by all humanity. I united myself with my forefathers, the father, mother, and grandparents that I loved. They and all my predecessors believed and lived, and they produced me. I united myself also with the mission of the common people whom I respected. Moreover, those actions had nothing bad in themselves. Bad, I considered the indulgence of one's desires. When rising early for church services, I knew I was doing well, if only because I was sacrificing my bodily ease to humble my mental pride, for the sake of union with my ancestors and contemporaries, and for the sake of finding the meaning of life. It was the same with my preparations to receive communion, and with the daily reading of prayers with genuflections, and also with the observance of all the fasts. However insignificant these sacrifices might be, I made them not for the sake of something good. I fasted, prepared for communion, and observed the fixed hours of prayers at home and in church. During church service, I attended to every word, and gave them a meaning whenever I could. In the Mass, the most important words for me were, let us love one another in conformity. The furthest words, in unity we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I passed by because I could not understand them. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Almer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was then so necessary for me to believe in order to live that I unconsciously concealed from myself the contradictions and obscurities of theology. But this reading of meanings into the rites had its limits. If the chief words in the prayer for the emperor became more and more clear to me, if I found some explanation for the words, and remembering our sovereign, most holy mother of God and all the saints, ourselves and one another, we give our whole life to Christ our God, if I explain to myself the frequent repetitions of prayers for the Tsar and his relations by the fact that they are more exposed to temptations than other people, and therefore are more in need of being prayed for, the prayers about subduing our enemies and evil under our feet, even if one tried to say that sin was the enemy being prayed against, these and other prayers such as the cherubic song, and the whole sacrament of oblation, or the chosen warriors, etc., quite two-thirds of all the services either remain completely incomprehensible or, when I forced an explanation into them, made me feel that I was lying thereby destroying my relation to God and depriving me of all possibility of belief. I felt the same about the celebration of the chief holidays. To remember the Sabbath, that is, to devote one day to God, was something I could understand. But the chief holiday was in commemoration of the resurrection, the reality of which I could not picture to myself or understand. And the name of resurrection was also given to the weekly holiday. And on those days, the sacrament of the Eucharist was administered, which was quite unintelligible to me. The rest of the twelve great holidays, except Christmas, commemorated miracles, the things I tried not to think about in order to not deny, the Ascension, Pentecost, Epiphany, the Feast of the Intercession of the Holy Virgin, etc. At the celebration of these holidays, feeling that importance was being attributed to the very things that to me presented a negative importance, I either devised tranquilizing explanations or shut my eyes in order not to see what tempted me. Most of all, this happened to me when taking part in the most usual sacraments, which are considered the most important baptism and communion. There I experienced not incomprehensible but fully comprehensible doings, doings which seemed to me to lead into temptation, and I was in a dilemma, whether to lie or to reject them. Never shall I forget the painful feeling I experienced the day I received the Eucharist for the first time after many years. The service, confession, and prayers were quite intelligible and produced in me a glad consciousness that the meaning of life was being revealed to me. The communion itself I explained as an act I performed in remembrance of Christ and indicating a purification from sin and the full acceptance of Christ's teachings. If that explanation was artificial, I did not notice its artificiality. So happy was I at humbling and abasing myself before a priest, a simple, timid country clergyman, turning all the dirt out of my soul and confessing my vices. So glad was I to merge in thought with the humanity of the fathers who wrote the prayers of the office. So glad was I of union with all those who have believed and now believe that I did not notice the artificiality of my explanation. But when I approached the altar gates, and the priest made me say that I believed that what I was about to swallow was truly flesh and blood, I felt a pain in my heart. It was not merely a false note, it was a cruel demand made by someone or other who evidently had never known what faith is. I now permit myself to say that it was a cruel demand, but I did not then think so, only that it was indescribably painful to me. I was no longer in the position in which I had been in youth, when I thought that all in life was clear. I had indeed come to faith because, apart from faith, I had found nothing certainly nothing except destruction. Therefore to throw away that faith was impossible and I submitted. And I found in my soul a feeling which helped me to endure it. This was the feeling of self-abasement and humility. I humbled myself, swallowed that flesh and blood without any blasphemous feelings, and with a wish to believe. But the blow had been struck, and knowing what awaited me, I could not go a second time. 
I continued to fulfill the rites of the church and still believed that the doctrine I was following contained the truth when something happened to me which I now understand but which then seemed strange. I was listening to the conversation of an illiterate peasant, a pilgrim, about God, faith, life, and salvation, when a knowledge of faith revealed itself to me. I drew near to the people, listening to their opinions of life and faith, and I understood the truth more and more. So also was it when I read the lives of holy men, which became my favorite books. Putting aside the miracles and regarding them as fables illustrating thoughts, this reading revealed to me life's meaning. There were the lives of Macarius the Great, the story of Buddha, there were the words of St. John Chrysostom, and there were the stories of the traveler in the well, the monk who found some gold, and of Peter the Publican. There were stories of the martyrs, all announcing that death does not exclude life. And there were the stories of ignorant, stupid men, who knew nothing of the teaching of the church, but who yet were saved. But as soon as I met learned believers or took up their books, doubt of myself, dissatisfaction, and exasperated disputation were roused in me. And I felt that the more I entered into the meanings of these men's speeches, the more I went astray from truth and approached an abyss. End of chapter 14. Chapter 15 of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Almer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. How often I envied the peasants for their illiteracy and lack of learning. Those statements in the creeds which to me were evident absurdities for them contained nothing false. They could accept them and could believe in the truth, the truth I believed in. Only to me, unhappy man, was it clear that with truth falsehood was interwoven by the finest threads, and that I could not accept them in that form. So I lived for about three years. At first, when I was only slightly associated with truth as a catechumen, and was only scenting out what seemed to me clearest, these encounters struck me less. When I did not understand anything, I said, it is my fault, I am sinful. But the more I became imbued with the truths I was learning, the more they became the basis of my life, the more oppressive and the more painful became these encounters, and the sharper became the line between that which I do not understand because I am not able to understand it, and what cannot be understood except by lying to oneself. In spite of my doubts and sufferings, I still clung to the Orthodox Church. But questions of life arose which had to be decided, and the decision of these questions by the Church, contrary to the very basis of the belief by which I lived, obliged me at last to renounce communion with Orthodoxy as impossible. These questions were, first, the relation of the Orthodox Eastern Church to other churches, to the Catholics and to the so-called sectarians. At that time, in consequence of my interest in religion, I came into touch with believers of various faiths, Catholics, Protestants, Old Believers, Molokans, and others. And I met among them many men of lofty morals who were truly religious. I wished to be a brother to them. And what happened? That feeling which promised to unite all in one faith and love, that very teaching, in the person of its best representatives, told me that these men were all living a lie, and that what gave them their power of life was a temptation of the devil, and that we alone possessed the only possible truth. And I saw that all who do not profess an identical faith with themselves are considered by the Orthodox to be heretics, just as the Catholics and others consider the Orthodox to be heretics. And I saw that the Orthodox, though they try to hide this, regard with hostility all those who do not express their faith by the same external symbols and words as themselves. And this is naturally so. First, because the assertion that you are in falsehood and I am in truth is the most cruel thing one man can say to another. And secondly, because a man loving his children and brothers cannot help being hostile to those who wish to pervert his children and his brothers to a false belief. And that hostility is increased in proportion to one's greater knowledge of theology. And to me, who considered that truth lay in union by love, it became self-evident that theology was itself destroying what it ought to practice. This offense is so obvious to us educated people who have lived in countries where various religions are professed and have seen the contempt, self-assurance, and invincible contradiction with which Catholics behave to the Orthodox Greeks and to the Protestants, and the Orthodox to the Catholics and the Protestants, and the Protestants to the two others, and the similar attitude of old believers, Pashkovites, Russian evangelicals, shakers, and all religions, that the very obviousness of the temptation at first perplexes us. One says to oneself, it is impossible that it is so simple, and that people do not see that if two assertions are mutually contradictory, then neither of them has the sole truth which faith should possess. There is something else here, there must be some explanation. I thought there was, and sought that explanation and read all I could on the subject, and consulted all whom I could. And no one could give me any explanation, except the one which causes the Sumsky Hussars to consider the Sumsky Hussars the best regiment in the world, and the Yao Uhans to consider the best regiment of the world as the Yao Uhans. The ecclesiastics of all the different creeds, through their best representatives, told me nothing but that they believed themselves to have the truth, and the others to be in error, and that all they could do was to pray for them. 
I went to Archimandrites, bishops, elders, monks of the strictest orders, and asked them. But none made any attempt to explain the matter to me except one man, who explained it all, and explained it so that I never had to ask anyone any more about it. I said that for every unbeliever turning to belief, and all our young generation are in a position to do so, the question that presents itself first is, why is truth not in Lutheranism, nor in Catholicism, but in Orthodoxy? Educated in the high school, he cannot help knowing what the peasants do not know, that the Protestants and Catholics equally affirm that their faith is the only true one. Historical evidence twisted by each religion in its own favor is insufficient. Is it not possible, said I, to understand the teaching in a loftier way, so that from its height the differences should disappear as they do for one who believes truly? Can we not go further along the path like the one we are following with the old believers? They emphasize the fact that they have a differently shaped cross and different alleluias and a different procession round the altar. We reply, you believe in the Nicene Creed, in the seven sacraments, and so do we. Let us hold to that, and in all other matters, do as you please. We have united with them by placing the essentials of faith above the unessentials. Now with the Catholics can we not say, you believe in so-and-so and in so-and-so, which are the chief things. As for the filioque clause and the Pope, do as you please. Can we not say the same to the Protestants, uniting with them in what is most important? My interlocutor agreed with my thoughts, but told me that such conceptions would bring reproach of the spiritual authorities for deserting the faith of our forefathers, and this would produce a schism, and the vocation of the spiritual authorities is to safeguard in all its purity the Greco-Russian Orthodox faith inherited from our forefathers. And I understood it all. I am seeking a faith, the power of life, and they are seeking the best way to fulfill in the eyes of men certain human obligations and fulfilling these human affairs, they fulfill them in a human way. However much they may talk of their pity for their erring brethren, and of addressing prayers for them to the throne of the Almighty, to carry out human purposes, violence is necessary, and it always has been applied and is and will be applied. If of two religions each considers itself true and the other false, then men desiring to attract others to the truth will preach their own doctrine. And if a false teaching is preached to the inexperienced sons of their church, which has the truth, then that church cannot but burn the books and remove the man who is misleading its sons. What is to be done with a sectarian, burning, in the opinion of the Orthodox, with the fire of false doctrine, who in the most important affair of life, in faith, misleads the sons of the church? What can be done with him except to cut off his head or incarcerate him? Under the Tsar Alexis Mikhailovich, people were burned at the stake, that is to say, the severest method of punishment of the time was applied, and in our day also the severest method of punishment is applied detention in solitary confinement. The second relation of the church to a question of life was with regard to war and executions. At the time, Russia was at war, and Russians, in the name of Christian love, began to kill their fellow men. It was impossible not to think about this, and not to see that killing is an evil repugnant to the first principles of any faith. Yet prayers were said in the church for the successes of our arms, and the teachings of the faith acknowledged killing to be an act resulting from faith. And besides the murders during war, I saw during the disturbances which followed the war, Christian dignitaries and teachers and monks of the lesser and stricter orders who approved the killing of helpless, erring youths. And I took note of all that is done by men who profess Christianity, and I was horrified. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Almer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. And I ceased to doubt, and became convinced that not all was true in the religion I had joined. Formerly, I should have said that it was all false, but I could not say so now. The whole of the people possessed a knowledge of the truth, for otherwise they could not have lived. Moreover, that knowledge was accessible to me, for I had felt it and lived by it. But I no longer doubted that there was also falsehood in it. And all that had previously repelled me now presented itself vividly before me. And though I saw that among the peasants there was a smaller admixture of lies that repelled me than among the representatives of the church, I still saw that in the peoples' belief also falsehood was mingled in the truth. But where did the truth and where did the falsehood come from? Both the falsehood and the truth were contained in the so-called holy tradition in the scriptures. Both the falsehood and the truth had been handed down by what is called the church. And whether I liked it or not, I was brought to the study and investigation of these writings and traditions, which till now I had been so afraid to investigate. And I turned to the examination of that same theology which I had once rejected with such contempt as unnecessary. Formerly it seemed to me a series of unnecessary absurdities, when on all sides I was surrounded by manifestations of life which seemed to me clear and full of sense. Now I should have been glad to throw away what would not enter a healthy head, but I had nowhere to turn to. On this teaching religious doctrine rests, or at least with it the only knowledge of the meaning of life I have found is inseparably connected. 
However wild it may seem to my firm old mind, it was the only hope of salvation. It had to be carefully, attentively examined in order to understand it, and not even to understand it as I understand the propositions of science. I do not seek that, nor can I seek it, knowing the special character of religious knowledge. I shall not seek the explanation of everything. I know that the explanation of everything, like the commencement of everything, must be concealed in infinity. But I wish to understand in a way which will bring me to what is inevitably inexplicable. I wish to recognize anything that is inexplicable as being not so because the demands of my reason are wrong, they are right, and apart from that I can understand nothing, but because I recognize the limits of my intellect. I wish to understand in such a way that everything that is inexplicable shall present itself to me as being necessarily inexplicable, and not as being something I am under an arbitrary obligation to believe. That there is truth in the teaching is to me indubitable, but it is also certain that there is falsehood in it, and I must find what is true and what is false, and must disentangle the one from the other. I am seeking to work upon this task. What of falsehood I have found in the teaching, and what I have found of truth, and to what conclusions I came, will form the following parts of this work, which if it be worth it, and if anybody wants it, will probably someday be printed somewhere. 1879. The foregoing was written by me some three years ago, and will be printed. Now a few days ago, when revising it and returning to this line of thought, to the feelings I had when I was living through it all, I had a dream. This dream expressed in the condensed form all that I have experienced and described, and I think therefore, for those who have understood me, a description of this dream will refresh and elucidate and unify what has been set forth at such a length in the foregoing pages. The dream was this. I saw that I was lying on a bed. I was neither comfortable nor uncomfortable. I was lying on my back. But I began to consider how and on what I was lying, a question which had not till then occurred to me. And observing my bed, I saw I was lying on plated string supports attached to its sides. My feet were resting on one such support, my calves on another, and my legs felt uncomfortable. I seemed to know that those supports were movable, and with a movement of my foot, I pushed away the furthest of them at my feet. It seemed to me that it would be more comfortable so. But I pushed it away too far and wished to reach it again with my foot, and that movement caused the next support under my calves to slip away also, so that my legs hung in the air. I made a movement with my whole body to adjust myself, fully convinced that I could do so at once but the movement caused the other supports under me to slip and become entangled, and I saw that matters were going quite wrong. The whole of the lower part of my body slipped and hung down, though my feet did not reach the ground. I was holding on only by the upper part of my back, and not only did it become uncomfortable, but I was even frightened. And then only did I ask myself about something which had not occurred to me before then. I asked myself, where am I and what am I lying on? And I began to look around and first of all look down in the direction which my body was hanging, and where I felt I must soon fall. I looked down and did not believe my eyes. I was not only at a height comparable to the height of the highest towers or mountains, but at a height such as I could have never even imagined. I could not even make out whether I saw anything there below, in that bottomless abyss above which I was hanging and whither I was being drawn. My heart contracted and I experienced horror. To look thither was terrible. If I looked thither I felt that I should at once slip from the last support and perish, and I did not look. But not to look was still worse, for I thought of what would happen to me directly if I fell from the last support. And I felt that from fear I was losing my last supports, and that my back was slowly slipping lower and lower. Another moment and I should drop off. And then it occurred to me that this cannot be real. It is a dream. Wake up. I try to arouse myself but cannot do so. What am I to do? What am I to do? I ask myself and look upwards. Above there is also an infinite space. I look into the immensity of sky and try to forget about the immensity below, and I really do forget it. The immensity below repels and frightens me, the immensity above attracts and strengthens me. I am still supported above the abyss by the last supports that have not yet slipped from under me. I know that I am hanging, but I only look upwards and my fear passes. As happens in dreams, a voice says, notice this, this is it. And I look more and more into the infinite above me and feel that I am becoming calm. I remember all that has happened and how it happened, how I moved my legs, how I hung down, how frightened I was, and how I was saved from fear by looking upwards. And I asked myself, well, and now am I not hanging just the same? And I do not so much look round as experience with my whole body the point of support on which I am held. I see that I no longer hang about as if to fall, but am firmly held. I ask myself how I am held. I feel round, look round, and see that under me, under the middle of my body, there is one support and that when I look upwards, I lie on it in a position of securest balance, and that it alone gave me the support before. And then, as happens in dreams, I imagine the mechanism by means of which I was held, a very natural, intelligible, and sure means, though to one awake the mechanism made no sense. I was even surprised in my dream that I had not understood it sooner. 
It appeared that at my head there was a pillar, and the security of that slender pillar was undoubted, though there was nothing to support it. From that pillar, a loop hung very ingeniously and yet simply, and if one lay with the middle of one's body in that loop and looked up, there could be no question of falling. This was all clear to me, and I was very glad and tranquil, and it seemed as if someone said to me, See that you remember. And I awoke. End of chapter 16 End of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Almer Maud